it's a bit windswept out there today. And thanks for all the kind thoughts on my videos. I just think, yes, I do concentrate a little bit too much on, say, the Romans. Strangely enough, it's not my favourite period of British history, to be honest with you. Oh, I might talk about that again. I'd like to talk about an archaeological site in Barry. There was a sensation when it was excavated back in the 1980s. It's a site locally known as the Atlantic Trading Estate the SRD, over the Bendrix. It's a place that was part of my growing up within archaeology. And also, there's another place nearby, which would be in popular folklore, Cosmester Medieval Village. Back in the 1980s, there was something called the Manpower Services Scheme. They gave employment to people that were out of work for a while and they either worked at something like Dufferin on the gardens or they may have worked in other areas of council working, charities, all sorts of different things. But there was also an opportunity for them to work in local archaeology. Now that was a time when said Glamorgan and Grant Archaeological Trust from my previous video actually had people that actually loved archaeology, cared for archaeology, people that I deeply respected. I had an opportunity after being a volunteer at Cosmaster Medieval Village about 1985-1986 to actually go on over to work at this SRD, Atlantic Trade and Estate. And the work itself was working alongside a chap by the name of Peter Wardle, Dr. Peter Wardle, who had had Barry Lynx. He was one of the managers, supervisors, archaeologists for said Glamona Gwent Archaeological Trust that we used to call GGAT or GGAT. I got fond mem memories of that work, working at a Bronze Age village site. But that is a story for another day. Before I got involved with my doings at the Atlantic Trading Estate, there was the excavations of said Atlantic Trading Estate as a burial site. And this burial site itself involved the human remains of up to 50 sets of beings. These ranged in various ages, dates, male, female, children, and some cremations. But interestingly enough, they were all positioned in a known area of burial that we found out about in the 1930s. Bronze Age, stroke Iron Age burial location, scheduled ancient monument there. Very close to where a said Ross Bronstock and myself brought down a tower to save it and to preserve it from the Second World War, near there. Anyway, this site itself that I'm talking about with up to 50 sets of human remains and the phone is ringing so I'm going to have to turn it off <laughs> bit of a disturbance there in the forest got a bit distracted there these human remains were really really well preserved some of them dating from the late 300s into the 400s, 500s and I think we had burials of shipwrecked individuals going all the way into <coughs> the 1700s. So quite an array. Real deep array of human remains. And back to something I've already mentioned, a well. They were all centred upon a well. 
either east to west, south to north, radiant manner. <coughs> and I don't really believe that's another thing, that uh, just because a body is orientated south, north or east, west, doesn't mean to say they're Christian or pagan. I found that to be complete nonsense over the years. So these sets of humour remains, the late Roman era ones, going into the 400s and into the 500s are very interesting. <coughs> so we think that they are linked to some kind of pilgrimage route or a settlement that we haven't really identified nearby. But it's fitting that they represent a part of our history that's very much understudied. Part of our history of graveyards and depositories of our ancestors that are a bit off the beaten track, away from churches and so on. So who were these people? It's mentioned that were they pilgrims? Were they part of a settlement? Were they shipwreck victims? Were they people buried under strange circumstances? I would say all of the above. <coughs> I like talking about this because the human remains were really, really well preserved. And I've got an image of them in my mind today. I'm, I'm looking at a school friend of mine, you know, who was with me the day that we were shown around by a local historian from Barry, Gerald Baudet. And he lifted up this board and there was a set of human remains underneath within a stone, um, within a stone lined grave. grave. Some of them were stone lined, others were placed in, we, we had traces of, uh, that they were placed into wooden coffins. Others may have been placed in shrouds, just into a hole in the ground, you know, everything. So it was a real good sort of microcosm of burial practice over, let's say 500 years. So why is this useful in my little series of lectures, sort of Roman, post-Roman, early medieval, Arthur and all the rest of it, because it's sort of, it's dedicated to that period. And I thought, I thought that would be wonderful to share with you all today. Now, just be so, before I sort of go today, I mentioned that thing about pilgrims. Now, what do you think about pilgrim, pilgrim routes? I used to come up with this story. I don't know if it's cock and bull, but you know, I used to come up with this story to explain the graves at the Atlantic Trade Estate as people that went from the mainland over to a chapel on Barry Island, Nell's Point, which may have had a different name back four or five hundred years ago, to visit a load of wells and and basically they visited some kind of holy shrine and then they made their way back along that route, right? And they they died. And the reason why I used to explain that was if you've got all these bodies radiating from a well, those that may have died of horrible diseases, obviously that lap leaching into the well to contaminate it, people take a drink out of that well on the way to um, Barry Island, they fall ill, on the way back, they drop dead and they're buried at this grave at Atlanta Trader State. I know that's totally cock and bull, right? But it's an interesting way of looking at the past. And sometimes that sort of adage from Brian Davis, Pontypridd Museum, um, is where there's, where there's a little bit of a myth and legend, just sort of keep it there. Whether it's fact or fiction, it sort of adds a bit of gentleness, a bit of interest in history. And again, back to those pilgrimage routes, you know, I think pilgrim, pilgrim routes don't need to be sort of opulent. They need to just be trackways. They're the same, tra same, same trackways that those people are obsessed with the Roman roads, which have been trackways that have been there for many generations well before the Roman era. But trackways to go from point A to B for people to visit places that meant something to them. So a pilgrimage just doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean to be, be a, a, a Christian pilgrimage or a pagan pilgrimage. It can just be a pilgrimage as a rite of passage. It can just be a pilgrimage of something that you actually do and want to do. So if there's things that you want me to talk about in a little bit more detail, put them in the comments box down below. I'm going to put this video up online and thanks for the support. 
and don't forget to like and subscribe and you've got the join button down below little blue button that says join it's one pound 99 a month and uh, you get extra little bits and bobs if you actually join anyway thank you very much keep safe and archaeology isn't always out to be thank you very much